Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today and welcome uh, to Procore's 2021 Media Predicts event with Construction Dive. My name is Noli LeBlanc and I work and do PR at Procore. And today we're hosting a discussion with two reporters from Construction Dive who are gonna shed some light on trends within construction and tech that will impact headlines in 2021. Um, these are topics you should be paying attention to if you're a part of the construction industry. So I'd like to welcome on Joe Bosquin and Zach Phillips, who should be joining any minute, both reporters from Construction Dive. Um, and for those of us joining live, feel free to pop any questions you may have into the chat box and we'll do our best to get those answered towards the end. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Joe and Zach. Welcome. And they can introduce themselves and talk a little bit about the beats you cover at Construction Dive, and then we'll jump right in. Great. Thanks, Noli. Great to be here. Thanks to Procore for hosting us today. Um, my name is Joe Bosquin. I'm a reporter for Construction Dive. I've been covering um, uh, construction and real estate since 2004. And at Construction Dive, I cover the policy and trends that impact contractors on a daily basis. And uh, I'm Zach Phillips, uh, Associate Editor for Construction Dive. Uh, I've been there since uh, September of 2019, so I had about six months before the pandemic. So most of my time there has been covering uh, construction during the pandemic. And I tend to focus on our tech beat as well as uh, uh, interest stories about stadiums or infrastructure projects. Awesome. Well, thank you both for joining us. We're so excited to have you and um, we'll jump into the conversation. I wanted to start off by asking you what words you predict will become buzzwords um, around construction and tech in 2021, if you have any guesses. Uh, yeah, I'll go first with that one. Um, I think uh, uh, one of the things that we've been sort of covering and talking about recently is uh, unions and labor. So kind of lump those in together as one sort of uh, buzzword. Uh, I think tech integration, especially with software stuff that is used every day on job sites is going to be something that we'll be seeing more of. And then this one's not necessarily a buzzword in terms of being like a, uh, uh, a new idea, but I think uh, backlog is something that we're probably going to be covering or uh, having to reevaluate over the course of the year. How about you, Joe? Right. So, Noli, I've got some acronym soup for you for buzzwords in 2021, and uh, it's going to include ETS. We're going to hear a lot about that with a emergency temporary standard. Uh, upcoming from OSHA in the next few weeks, uh, most likely. Uh, we're going to hear about ESG, which stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. It's an investing philosophy that I'll talk about. And of course, everybody's marquee buzzword in 2021, infrastructure. Awesome. Well, we'll be sure to loop back to those throughout our discussion to make sure we touch on each of those buzzwords. Um, I, of course, we can't talk about 2021 without addressing 2020 and the pandemic. And um, I would love to hear your insight on how you think COVID-19 will continue to impact the construction industry into 2021. Um, and some, what are some ways that you would suggest construction businesses respond to the impact in light um, specifically of continued material shortages, health concerns, and an even more competitive market? Um, I believe you shared this, Joe, stat that material costs have increased on average 8% and bids have only increased 0.1%. Um, so what are your thoughts around how this will continue to shape construction industry? Right. Definitely great and timely question. And, uh, you know, I'll credit Ken Simonson at the America uh, at the Associated General Contractors of America for that uh, spread between bid prices and material prices. Uh, he follows those closely. Um, this is near and dear to my heart uh, right now. I have an upcoming story on the site about material prices. And we've really seen just since the holidays, um, things really spiking. 
Uh, steel has gone up considerably, 20, 25% since then. We had uh, a message from Nucor Steel, major supplier, sending out two notices in basically a week's time to their customers saying, you know, this price increase that we're telling you about today is the second price increase uh, that we're telling you about in the last seven days. Nobody likes to write that letter. Nobody likes to get that letter. But it is the reality of the um, marketplace right now. And it's not just steel, it's lumber, it's drywall. It's a lot of the components that steel goes into, appliances, things like that. I'm hearing from my sources that suppliers are telling them it's really a supply issue, right? They still can't get uh, workers back into factories at, uh, you know, at a full you know, full staff level. Um, we've got supply chain issues. Last week, there were 37 cargo tankers sitting off of Los Angeles waiting for dock space because the dock workers were sick with COVID and there weren't enough dock workers to unload those shipments. So, um, you know, this is going to be a continued trend uh, in 2021. And you know, uh, nobody knows how that's going to end. The good news is one of the acronyms I mentioned before, ETS, the Emergency Temporary Standard, that should be forthcoming from Biden's uh, Occupational Safe and Healthy Health Administration uh, by March 15th. Um, and it will give a uniform set of rules to preventing and combating uh, COVID in the workplace. Uh, which has been lacking to date. If, if that happens, that, that could potentially help us get ahead of this crisis and help people return to work safely, which will give us a big leg up on this thing. Yeah, and you know, uh, materials have been more Joe's uh, uh, beat sort of uh, in the past couple months since he joined the team. Um, I, and I've covered it to some extent, but I think uh, one of the things is figuring out if construction is going to build differently, what that means. I've talked to people who seem to think that uh, construction of like office spaces, for example, where uh, people perceive the notion of how we're gonna interact in a public office setting, uh, if people are gonna ever have small workspaces again, and uh, you know, if we return to the office, what it looks like, as that's still being figured out, some people think that construction of office spaces will never be the same. Some think we're going to return to normal. And so the, the path to informing if construction will change has yet to be fully realized. Uh, I mentioned backlog earlier. Um, you know, contractors depend on their future contracted work. As Joe, as those statistics say, and as Joe was saying, if bids are less lucrative and material prices are continuing to be different, I think the security of backlog might come into question for some contractors and you know the long the long long term impact of covid has yet to be seen and by that i sort of mean the time beyond if uh, uh when people are vaccinated when places can open up again how it's going to change and develop beyond that how long it takes for prices to sort of even back out we're really not sure what that period is going to look like yet Awesome, thank you both. Um, I you touched a little bit on you know the administration, the new Biden administration, and legislation, and we can't talk about that without bringing up the Pro Act and how that is to affect the construction industry at large. And I'd love um, Zach. I know you're kind of covering this specifically. Um, what people in the industry should be aware of in regard to this new piece of legislation and um, just a little bit of insight from you on that. I know you've done a lot of research, so I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, yeah, definitely. So um, at the risk of, of, of plugging something, uh, my deep dive into the PRO Act, which is on Construction Dive's site now, uh, it, it's long, but it's worth the read because of the, the many nuanced parts of the PRO Act. But I'll, I'll get into some of the, the, the larger uh, parts of it, which is that um, the, the short answer is that under Joe Biden's administration, he has made it clear that labor relations are likely to change. And the PRO Act seems to be the path to doing that. Uh, I talked to one union rep for this story who his stance was basically not necessarily that this law needs to, that this bill needs to become a law, but that 
conversation about changing the way that employers and employees and unions interact needs to change. So the PRO Act, a couple of important things to know, it would eliminate right to work states where there are 27 states that have these uh, laws that essentially uh, determine, if these laws were to go away, it would force contractors and unions to collectively bargain to figure out how much unions could compel workers to join. And that would also change so that union members in those states would have to pay dues in order to receive the representation and benefits of those unions. Additionally, the definition of what an employer and an employee in the eyes of the government would change, which would mean that contractors who have employees from a bunch of different subcontractors on their job sites or independent contractors that are hired would need to be aware that they may qualify as employees now, which means they might qualify for benefits if they're injured. Uh, uh, employers on job sites are liable for workers that they would not have been in the past. Uh, and even if the PRO Act doesn't pass, which it might not, the fact is provisions might find their way into other bills, which is something contractors need to be aware of. And this conversation isn't going away, especially because within the next four years uh, in the US, Joe Biden is likely to at least enact some of these practices when it comes to federal construction jobs. Right. And uh, sorry, Noli. Um, yeah, if I, if I could just speak to that for just a second. And um, I, I really would echo Zach, if you haven't, uh, what, what Zach said, if you haven't already, you know, check out his uh, article on Construction Dive about the PRO Act. He does a great job of taking a complex issue and breaking it down with clarity and uh, giving contractors insight into it. Um, for me, from my perspective, the PRO Act really speaks to, uh, you know, my, my second uh, acronym, which is ESG, uh, the Environmental, Social and Governance uh, Investing Philosophy. Um, and, and it has to do with uh, the social change that we saw in 2020. You know, we, we saw tremendous social upheaval in 2020, not just with COVID, but also um, with uh, the death of George Floyd and uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, movement uh, really coming to a head. At the same time, ESG from an investment perspective really gained a lot of ground where you have multi-trillion dollar investment funds really uh, requiring the companies that they invest in to have uh, programs that uh, address their environmental impact that address the way that they treat workers in terms of socialization and uh, you know, ethic and ethical employment, um, the way they present their, themselves in terms of transparency. And so I wouldn't be surprised where the PRO Act seems like a very political thing that's you know, on Capitol Hill right now, but it could very well be something that investors hold contractors accountable to in terms of the rights that they give workers mm. and how they treat workers in terms of that employee employer relationship so it might not just be coming from uh you know top down in terms of government it might be coming from where the money comes from and on any story or any development, you got to follow the money. I think ESG is going to be part of the PRO Act. Awesome. I feel like I already have a better understanding. Uh, it's a complicated piece of legislation, so be sure to read up on it and on Construction Dive with Zach's article um, if you want more information. I want to start addressing a little bit more specifically some articles that you two have written recently. Um, Joe, I'll speak to you first. Uh, currently, the construction industry is one of the world's largest sectors, um, and roughly $10 trillion is spent on construction-related goods and services each year. And the, the number is expected to increase um, as urban development expands. And so we know now that the population of the world's urban areas is increasing by nearly 200,000 people per day, and 55% of the world's population lives in urban areas. 
but that percentage is expected to jump to 68% in by 2050. Um, so this obviously requires updated infrastructure, like you mentioned is one of your buzz buzzwords, um, and more affordable housing specifically. In your recent article, Joe, Six Trends That Will Influence Construction This Year, you wrote about Michael Boards, who is the president of the New York City General Contractors AA Jetson Company. Um, and he explained that he had to pivot from previously what he was doing, which was restaurants and gyms, um, to focus on affordable housing projects that were considered essential. And so the construction, the commercial construction industry has taken the brunt of the most recent recession. We know that. And we see the need for continued build out of affordable housing. Do you see the con construction companies trending towards and moving towards multifamily housing residential builds um, during these economic downturns? And if this is the majority, do you think this will lead to a potential oversaturation of residential builders? What's what are the trends that you've been picking up on in your research? Sure, it's a it's a great question and a great topic. Um, you know, you you really hit on it, Noli, in, in that you know contractors in 2020 really took it on the chin on the non-residential side, on the commercial side. I mean, we talked about material costs. Uh, we talked about the the bid um, uh, uh, material spread widening. Uh, you know, we've seen survival bidding, uh, as it's called, where contractors basically buy jobs just so they can keep their, their people busy and stay in business. Um, and so we have seen a, a shift among some contractors to go into residential out of necessity, right? And, and residential has been the place to be, particularly on the single family side, um, you know, multifamily as well. But uh, what we've really seen is a real uptick in single family as urban uh, city dwellers have really wanted to move out to the suburbs to, you know, get away from, from a dense population center in terms of COVID. Um, that would suggest that there could be more housing built and more affordable housing built. However, uh, you know, I spoke with a, a contractor the other day. He made a very good point. He said, you know, there is no such thing as affordable housing. There is only subsidized housing. Mm. And what he meant by that is it costs the same to build an affordable housing unit as it does a market rate unit, right? Yeah. People are having um, problems covering their rent right now. Um, you know, we, we've seen the, the rent rolls uh, decrease uh, uh, in recent months, and there's now, uh, you know, upwards of $70 billion in you know, uh, outstanding rent since the beginning of the pandemic. So I think there's a desire to go into residential. I think that, you know, it makes sense that there's a need there. Whether contractors can pivot and afford to go there is another question, especially if developers look at their rent rolls and say, hey, I'm not collecting rent on the apartments I already have. I don't know if I can afford to build new ones. Uh, so it's a tricky wick and, uh, you know, something we'll just have to wait to uh, to see in terms of uh, where it where it leads in 2021. Yeah. Thank you for your sharing. Uh, it's complicated, like you said. So yeah. there's a lot of moving pieces, but I think it's important to yeah to hear what you're picking up on in the industry with the people you're talking to and um, through your sources. And Zach, I wanted to circle back to one of your buzzwords, which you mentioned, which was integration. Um, you recently wrote an article about construction app usage and discussed the clear need for integrated data specifically um, amidst construction professionals. And in the 2020 JB Knowledge Contact Report, it found that 92% of respondents are using their smartphones every day on the job site. Um, however, it also found that only 20% of respondents um, are using applications that are integrated between the other apps, so the data is integrated between apps. So what are users saying is the key driver behind this lack of integration? Um, and is it legacy systems, lack of connection between those, those commonly used tools? And in your opinion, um, and based off your research, what data do you think construction professionals are most interested in seeing integrated? 
Uh, great questions. Um, I would encourage people to check out uh, JB Knowledge's report, um, as they were the ones who who captured all of that data and recorded it. Um, Oftentimes what we try to do a construction dive uh, for those unfamiliar is especially when there's reports or, or data like that, we like to uh, use our brief format to show the data findings and then have an insight section where we try to bring a little bit extra um, to to the numbers, to the data or whatever the news might be, um, just to go a little bit extra into the story coverage. Uh, you know, there's always a new uh, robot, a new drone, a new autonomous uh, bulldozer. There's always something that's being announced that is very exciting. And while I'm not trying to knock the, the technology like that, the fact of the matter is your average construction worker, your average job site isn't going to use this brand new state of the art drone or be scrambling to, to drop all the money on it, uh, even though they might eventually become more commonplace the average construction worker and the average job site is depending on their cell phone and their tablet and their laptop or whatever technology they can carry around with them that can do everything. And most people already have these smartphones. For the most part, they're used for data capture. They're used for uh, images. They're used for everything from, you know, taking pictures and video to record for, for BIM and for keeping up to date uh, documentation to timesheets, to people who strap on uh, a headset to their phone and walk around to give a, a tour virtually for the owner. Uh, I, as we went into the pandemic, we, we sort of transitioned and you, job sites had, you know, owners who would regularly come to visit who are now stranded cities or states or countries away and very quickly we as a as a planet got used to using zoom and other formats of communicating virtually and as a result have gotten used to passing this information around and i think as a result the the path is to sort of straighten that pipeline out even more so that uh, it's more efficient so you're having workers who are walking around taking these images and then in order to get them into their bim file they have to email these images to themselves or they have to manually transfer them to these other applications or re-enter the data because the apps don't communicate with each other so the natural next step is trying to find a way to eliminate human error save that extra time that is done on the job site um, and, you know, I'm not sure if it's going to be all of a sudden all of these apps that are likely competitors are going to become best friends and make things happen together uh, or how it's going to come about. But in general, that the next logical step is for all of the information to flow easier now that it's all accessible from any point. Awesome. Yeah, I want to come back to um a little bit more around infrastructure too. Um, and with the stimulus packages that we know are being passed and worked on um, with funds being allocated towards infrastructure and updates to green building, the last green push created a lot of work for MEPs, manufacturing extension partnerships and around specifically around modernization of these facilities um, to meet new standards and create tax incentives. Um, do you think both increases in infrastructure funding and green building will provide new opportunities for subcontractors? Um, and how would you speculate these stimulus packages will affect the construction industry at large? Joe, I know you've touched a little bit on this in the past, so I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, sure. And the, the short answer is, you know, I do expect this to uh, have a, a positive impact on, on contractors in the year ahead. Um, and, and they're all very excited about it. You know, I, I listened to AECOM's uh, uh, earnings call the other day. Um, Jacobs had their earnings call the other day. They both mentioned infrastructure spending. And this is really where, when you bring up, you know, green building standards, where two of my buzzwords intersect, which is infrastructure and ESG. Because if you look at Biden's initiatives, um, you know, on on equity and, um, you know, uh, just uh, making the social impacts of policy more equal across different sectors of society. 
you can bet that when the big infrastructure package that we should hear more details about in President Biden's State of the Union address uh, later this month, that there will be definitely those green strings attached for efficiency. There will be those social strings attached in terms of uh, minority and women-owned businesses being included and uh, you know these dollars not just being spent for another you know uh, you know business as usual paving project. Uh, mm -hmm. You're hearing a lot about that now. So I think there are going to be some changes in that realm. I think contractors can benefit from it, but they're also going to need to uh, you know tune up their skis, uh, so to speak, to uh, stay with that trend and uh, and qualify for those dollars. Awesome. Um, thank you both for sharing. I feel like I've already learned so much and it's been very informative. Um, if you're listening, I would encourage you to read up on Construction Dive's website for more information on these topics. Um, both Joe and Zach dive in and have a ton more information than we were able to touch on here, but um, this is a really good place to start. So I would encourage you to continue to do your own research. Um, you've both been so generous with your time already, so I won't keep you much longer, but is there anything else you want to leave our audience with as we move forward into 2021? Uh, sure. I'll, I'll leave you with, um, you know, we all know 2020 bad, um, 2021, hopefully better, <laughs> uh, but we're not done with this pandemic yet. It's not done with us, unfortunately. But uh, you know, we've just got to keep our uh, keep our chins up, keep our guard up against the virus, and uh, you know, wait for that rebound to come. Hopefully, second half of the year. Uh, uh, exactly, forging forward. Hopefully, having a better year. Especially, you know, uh, I think each of us doing our part, whatever that is, as the uh, finish line begins to materialize. Uh, finally, somewhat visible and imaginable. Um, Still don't know when it'll be, but you know, just I think forging forward. Yeah, we're a resilient industry, a construction industry. So, um, thank you both again for your time, and I appreciate everyone that was able to join. Um, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Noli. Bye. Thanks, Noli. Thanks everybody for joining.